Pesto loved a challenge. For someone who is now so strongly connected to the Côte d'Azur, Picasso was something of a Johnny-come-lately when he made his first visit. Many of the painters he greatly respected, like Henri Matisse and Georges Braque, had expressed their love of the place and, more importantly, its effect on their art. But Picasso had resisted. When he finally did make the trip in 1919, he was 37 years old and widely acclaimed as the leading avant-garde painter of his generation. But he didn't come down here looking for something new, but something very old indeed. Picasso was becoming fascinated by classical antiquity. The set designs he did for a Ballet Russe production in London that year, the three-cornered hat, demonstrate that even he was experiencing the pull of the return to order. That August, he explored the Roman ruins that litter the landscape around the town of Frejus. Picasso was at a turning point in his career. He felt that he had pushed Cubism as far as it could go, that if he went any further with it, it would become merely abstract painting. And that was a step he was never prepared to take. He was also becoming interested in the classical, in part under the pressure of the call to order. He would always be playful with it and slightly ironic. But I think it's clear that he was also interested in what was going on down here. He sensed that there was an emergent artistic scene, and he wanted to check out what was going on. There was an awful lot going on in his personal life at this time, both domestically and artistically. And these classical ruins, half buried in the sandy Mediterranean pine woods, would lead him in a new direction. The previous summer, Picasso married the ballerina Olga Kochlova a dancer with the Ballet Russe. They travelled extensively across Europe, visiting the classical ruins in Rome and the excavations at Pompeii, which hugely broadened his horizons, but also dramatically changed the kind of life he was leading. Ever since his arrival in Paris at the turn of the century, Picasso had tended to hang out in bohemian areas and identifying with the working class, living the life of the outcast artist. But by the mid-teens, he was essentially becoming upwardly mobile. One of the clearest signs of that was his friendship with Diaghilev and others in the Ballet Russe. It's there that he meets his wife, Olga, said to be the daughter of a Russian colonel, very elegant, very refined, very different from the kind of bohemian women that Picasso had previously been involved with. Though he was mocked by his friends for his bourgeois new lifestyle, Picasso did his best to keep up appearances. The couple stayed at the Grand Hotel Continental des Bains, which used to occupy this corner of the seafront in San Rafael. The French Prime Minister, Georges Clemenceau, was a regular in the hotel restaurant. San Rafael was typical of the way the Riviera was developing. The population of this ancient fishing village had tripled in the previous 50 years, and it was now a resort town whose grand hotels and amusements catered to the burgeoning middle-class holidaymaker. This was not Picasso's normal milieu. It was highly unlikely that a leopard could so suddenly and comfortably change his spots. Though you had to give Picasso top marks for effort, he was certainly aware of the imposture. He told one of his models, my Russian wife likes tea, caviar, and pastries. Me, I like sausage and beans. Whatever he liked to eat, he certainly liked the Côte d'Azur, and he couldn't wait to come back. The following summer marked the start of Picasso's true love affair with the Riviera. He knew the coast now and found a villa above the beach at Jouen la Pin with a view of the sea. Just before leaving Paris, the couple discovered that Olga was pregnant. Picasso was like a child bursting with anticipation for a long desired treat. He started painting the seaside two weeks before they were due to leave. When he got to the coast, it was exactly as he'd seen it in his imagination. At that moment, he said, I knew that this landscape was mine. And he was to make it his own. It was an incredibly productive summer spent in relaxed informality in their villa, much more in keeping with the diet of sausage and beans. Picasso even claimed to have learned to swim in the Mediterranean. 
he had discovered the hedonistic life the Riviera was famous for. The paintings he made that summer are of statuesque but decidedly sturdy women, swimming or laying on the beach. They inhabit a timeless classical Arcadia, given over entirely to a life of pleasure, bathing and enjoying the sun on their naked skin. This is a vision of life on the Mediterranean shores at any point in history. Only the book being read by the nearest figure gives the game away. But in a drawing that same summer, Picasso explores another side of classical mythology. One of his bathers has been carried off by a centaur and doesn't look too pleased about it. In order to paint these mythical creatures, he had to come down to the Riviera to see them. He couldn't do it in Paris. I feel that they live in these parts, he said. But he knew what he was talking about. When it came to classical mythology, he'd done his homework. Picasso had been reading the German philosopher Nietzsche, who drew a distinction between the two Greek gods, Apollo and Dionysus. Apollo, god of sun, god of music and poetry, Nietzsche associated with classical beauty, calm, restraint, and so forth. But the classical had a dark side, Nietzsche said, and that dark side was Dionysus, god of wine, god of madness, god of destruction. The Riviera could be seen as having an Apollo side, the civilized and polite resorts such as Nice, but it could also be seen as having the characteristics of Dionysus, the debauched parties that people went to, the semi-naked bathing in the sea, giving oneself over to a kind of uncontrolled hedonism. For the next 50 years, Picasso very adroitly kept these two forces in equilibrium, painting images that recorded the hedonistic Dionysian life of the Riviera, while also always keeping it at arm's length, observing the madness, but wary of getting too personally involved. As the exuberant chaos of the Roaring Twenties got into its stride, Dionysus was about to recruit a whole new legion of followers. The Riviera had been the playground of Europe for a generation, drawing a rich aristocratic clientele, but its reputation had by now crossed the Atlantic. Ocean liners traveled directly from New York to the ports of the Mediterranean coast. America was about to fall in love with the Riviera and would in the process completely change its character. This is the Hotel du Cap, on the very tip of the Antilles Peninsula. It had always been popular with British tourists since it opened in 1889. But in May every year, the British went home before the weather got too hot, and the hotel closed until September. But in 1923, a wealthy young American couple, Gerald and Sarah Murphy, asked the owner of the hotel to stay open for the summer, to accommodate themselves and their many arty and influential friends that they hoped would come down and join them. He agreed, and this one small step for the Murphys' comfort went on to be a giant leap in the fortunes of the Riviera. The speed with which this change to the established order spread to other hotels was astonishing. By the mid-1920s, almost every hotel on this coast had followed the lead of the Hotel du Cap and opened for the summer. The image of the Riviera in the public mind changed just as dramatically. The pre-war advertisements, featuring chic ladies in long dresses, enjoying the winter sun, gave way to images that concentrated on bathing costumes and the beach life of the summer vacation. The Murphys were in their early 30s and both from American business dynasties. They were jazz age refugees, fleeing prohibition and parental disapproval of their marriage. The great motivation for their move to France was a hunger for some old world culture. When it came to their summer holidays, however, they had new world habits and enjoyed it in a way that would be familiar to us today. Their carefree concept of leisure was very different to the way that tourists enjoyed this coast in the past. Rather than promenading in the shady grounds of the hotel under a parasol, they went swimming in the sea, covered themselves in banana oil, and set about getting a tan. Their behavior horrified the kind of guests who normally stayed in the hotel. In the 1890s, the American inventor of the cornflake, John Harvey Kellogg, 
suggested that sunlight was beneficial to human health, and this odd notion was suddenly beginning to be taken seriously. For previous generations of holiday makers, a suntan was a sign of poverty. You only got brown if you couldn't avoid the sunlight. But the Murphys were part of a dramatic and sudden change in attitude in the early 20s, and it all started here on the tennis court. Conventional ladies' tennis attire in the early years of the century seemed to have been designed for anything but tennis. But in 1919, the flamboyant French tennis star Suzanne Langlam managed to win the Wimbledon women's singles without the support of a corset, wearing a dress which revealed her bare arms. And if this wasn't shocking enough, the exposed skin was deeply tanned. As a sports star, Langlam made tanned skin a sign of a healthy lifestyle but it became fashionable when the designer Coco Chanel arrived on the Côte d'Azur on the Duke of Westminster's yacht in 1923, having acquired a deep tan on the voyage. Having a tan suddenly became a symbol of youth, freedom and a bohemian lifestyle, and the Riviera was the perfect place to lead this kind of life. The Murphys were utterly captivating, wrote one friend, and their summer trips to the Riviera attracted an ever-changing group of visitors who helped make their holiday as amusing as possible. This little stretch of sandy beach at Plage de la Garoupe would have been more or less deserted in the 1920s, and they adopted it as their base, spending the day there, partying and picnicking, Gerald brought a rake to clear away the seaweed each morning. During the previous summer, they'd stayed with Cole Porter, and the following year, Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald would join them. But in 1923, their star guest was Pablo Picasso, along with his wife Olga, their two-year-old son Polo, and his mother Donna Maria. With so many fun seekers coming and going, it must have felt like one long, never-ending party of the kind Jay Gatsby was so fond of giving. Here, they are all enjoying a fancy dress party on the beach. Olga in a tutu seems to be wearing her work clothes, and Picasso later complained it was all too rowdy with too many cocktails. All of this leisure activity overshadowed the fact that Gerald was an extremely gifted painter himself. His precise architectural depictions of the minutiae of their life owe something to Cubism, but he had his own unmistakable technique. This picture, Cocktail, is a hymn to an important ritual in their daily routine. When Gerald mixed a drink, he was said to resemble a priest at mass. And whilst this painting may appear to have used the cubist technique of collage, in fact, every detail was painstakingly painted by Gerald. Their enchanted life on the Côte d'Azur had a tragic ending, though. Both of their sons died in quick succession in the 1930s, and during the Depression, they were forced to return to America, where Gerald took over management of the family firm. He gave up painting and became the businessman his father had always wanted him to be. In 1934, their friend, Scott Fitzgerald, published Tender is the Night, whose main characters, Nicole and Dick Diver, lived a life on the Riviera that closely mirrored the Murphy's own but their bitter, destructive personalities were the complete opposite of his hosts, on whose sunny, carefree lives they were based. The Murphys were later described as masters in the art of living, but it seemed everyone was having a good time now. One could get away with more on the summer Riviera, wrote Scott Fitzgerald, and whatever happened seemed to have something to do with art. Summer on the Riviera had been attracting artists for years. The art academies of Paris were closed, and the Riviera, a winter resort, was cheap. Now, all of a sudden, in no small part due to the Murphys' family holidays, this sleepy summer backwater was where the important things were taking place. Artists, consequently, were everywhere on this coast. The old guard were well established. Matisse and Nice, Picasso and Antibes, Bonnard in Le Canet. But now, a host of new names were to join them. Jean Cocteau in Villefranche, 
Marcel Duchamp and Francis Picabia 